Hello, everyone. My name is Tanil Mack. I'm the current public programming and engagement intern at Studio Museum for the spring semester. And after we've had a wonderful time watching Adabukala's films, let's get into some questions that further discuss her background and interest within Afrofuturism itself. And as I'm asking questions, if you feel like you have anything that you'd like to further discuss, please feel free to raise a hand and we have a mic going around to get any of those questions. In the article, Listening to the Male Gaze, Voice Politics and the Videos of Adabukala Bodonrin, you described your childhood as very cosmopolitan and multicultural. In what ways did growing up as a Nigerian Canadian inform your identity and the way you place yourself in the world? Yeah, so um, hi guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the pieces. Thanks for coming out uh, to watch it. Um, and I'm sure it's very similar to New York, but Toronto is like a super diverse city. Um, and especially uh, when I was growing up there, the school I went to, pretty much everybody was like an immigrant's kid. So even though um, I was like one of two black girls in class, everybody, there was like no majority. Um, and so uh, everybody was sort of dealing with like, uh, being an immigrant kid in Canada. And it really, I feel like fostered an, I, an idea of like coming up with like a collective identity where like we had of course our cultural identity and then there was like this new way of interacting and um, sort of sorting out who you are, you know, while you're at school. Um, and I think that like, um, Afrofuturism is very much kind of like that, where like you're kind of rewriting and sort of coming up with new origin stories and new stories and new ways to sort of tell the same story stories. I'm glad you briefly touched on it. And our next question is, given the theme of tonight and the festival, what does Afrofuturism mean to you and how do you personally define it? Um, so I feel like it's, it's an amazing, um, cipher that can mean so many things to so many, uh, different people, but I definitely like to think of it as a sort of narrative device to explore ideas and themes from different perspectives. And I think especially, um, from, um, like an American perspective, it's, it's almost like a way of thinking about, um, creating like a connection, like creating new connections of like severed connections and sort of like imagining a world or possibilities where like your connection to your homeland like wasn't severed. So it's like forming these ideas and also very much of like the diaspora of like picking and choosing and like kind of collaging a lot of things together like I said, to sort of create a new narrative, create a new mythology. Um, while animation takes precedence in your work, movement and music also heavily contribute to the overall construction of your films. Why is it important for you to include these elements? I think especially with um, experimental cinema, when you're like trying out different visual devices, that could be sometimes um, difficult or new to audiences. I think it's great to give them um, a baseline to sort of um, connect to. And I think sound and music is a really great way to anchor someone's experience, especially when they're um, taking in like new visual information. So I do like to think of music and sound as an anchor that allows me to sort of be more bold with my visuals. Yeah, I think especially in the first film, we had a chance to see the golden chain. All of those elements were tied in together. And with themes of curiosity and connectivity, um, explored through relationships of Yatunde and the overseers on the space station, 
at what point of your adolescence did you take notice of differences in the way people in your environment seek community and how did that affect your perspective and what a support system is? Yeah, so um, when I moved to the States when I was around 13, 14, so like a beginning teenager and um, uh, my mom had a ton of family in Canada. I grew up with like my aunts, my cousins, just over each other's house, holidays all the time. And when we moved to um, Florida, it was going from Toronto to Florida was like such a, sh like it was such a culture shock. Like I can't even begin to <laughs> explain what it felt like, like feeling like I was in control of my life. Like I took the bus to school, I rode the subway to suddenly feeling um, really alienated in the States. Um, and suddenly feeling like I didn't have that support system or cultural system anymore. And then in the States, I, um, I was suddenly asked to like redefine my identity and who I was in like a way that I hadn't really thought about before. Um, and so, and so I think I, I tend to re-explore those themes a lot in my work, this idea of feeling displaced and trying to sort of redetermine who you are when you're put in a new place without any anchors. And I think while feeling displaced and isolated, I'm interested in knowing more about what does your ideal workspace look like and what is it that makes you comfortable and most creative? Um, I definitely like to work in like a sunny room really important to me is making sure my desk doesn't face a wall. I hate feeling trapped in. So I always have to place my desk in a way that I can look out into something um, so that I can just feel like that there's like sort of endless possibilities. And as an animator, like the bigger the screen, the better. Uh, I, I have to work with a mouse. I hate using a trackpad. Mm -hmm. So just a sunny space where I feel like open, not trapped. Yes. And speaking of being trapped in sort of these boxes that we can be put in, um, my next question is in regards to being a filmmaker and having agency and what does it mean to seek possibility for Black people in the future? Uh, it is, <laughs> I like to not think of it, I like to not think of myself as a sole voice. I think I'm, a, I'm part of a huge collective and one perspective and one voice. I do like, um, I do like giving people a sense of solidarity so that they can feel like their stories are also out there but i do i do like to think of myself as part of a collective and and not the voice of anything or even the voice of afrofuturism thank you so much so now um we'd like to open it up to the audience for any questions or possible feedback that you may have Uh, thank you again. Um, great job. Sorry if I'm too loud for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was like, wait, headphones are <laughs> loud. But oh, yes, go ahead. Um, so I noticed in all of your films, you seem to center the female form. And I'm wondering why and what do you hope audiences take from that? Um, I, I think it's just a way of projecting myself into the story. I always gravitated as a kid to women characters and always wanted to see more of their stories out there. So I, I think it's just, it's just a way of putting myself into my work without actually having, without actually putting myself in it. Um, hi, thank you so much for your work. I was just wondering, 
a little bit more about like the process of creating uh, one of these videos and your animation process. Like it was really cool and there's a ton going on. So like, I don't know, like how long does that take and like how many people work on that and you know, what's sort of the more material evolution of your work? Yeah, uh, I guess I work in a very uh, collage style of, of work. I, I like to really um, go between digital and sort of more tactile stuff. So as you can tell, I use a lot of sort of um, hinged figures in After Effects. I do a lot of the character animation in After Effects, but I'll also do a lot of direct animation onto film where I'll like scratch Black Leader or um, dye it or bleach it and then we'll transfer that to video and then we'll further sort of play with that sort of distortion um, in After Effects with different things um, or just working with a lot of paper textures that I'll scan and bring in um, to then work digitally. So I so like very much I like to work in like a, a collage style and then it's usually um, just me working on the pieces, which is why they take me so long. Golden Chain was a collaboration with um, graphic novelist Ezra Clayton Daniels. We um, uh, came up with the idea together and then uh, he wrote the script and he did the character designs. Um, and then I like did all the animation um, and uh, yeah, we worked with a sound designer for the sound too, because sound is very important, but yeah, it, it all depends on like the piece also like what am I doing in my work life because I uh, have a, you know, a, a job so <laughs> I'm making these pieces, you know, in my own spare time. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's fast and sometimes it's short as animation is just crazy. Hi, hello. Hi. Um, um, very happy about what I saw. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to hear more about the video. The There was a kind of like, we are humans walking into a evolution path. Evolution path. Yeah. Is it they, the they, Uli, the they, Uli moves? They unite together and they become into a will. I, I think you're talking about the Uli moves, yes. the one with the aliens with the tentacles. Yes, yes, that one. I want to okay. talk more about that creative process. <laughs> sure, no problem. So right. that piece, um, I was approached by um, a record company to uh, make a music video for, for the song that you heard made by Nicole Mitchell. And so she made this entire album based on an Octavia Butler book series called Lilith's Brood. It's an amazing book series. I like, you have to read it. And so um, the basic idea of the book is that like, uh, Earth has been destroyed by like man's own folly. And there's this alien race, the Uli, who are kind of gene swappers. They go around the universe and they like to sort of improve uh, like a, a species by like taking the genes that they think are bad and improving them. So right before the Earth blows themselves up, they rescue rescue um, a set of humans and so the way that they gene swap is that they they have to sort of go through this mating ritual and as you can tell the uli are like quite gross and grotesque to the humans um and so this the song in particular that i was asked to animate to was about this weird repulsion and attraction that happens between the Uli and the humans because the humans become dependent on the Uli, but they don't really want to be. Like the book is a really great look at the idea of like con consent in a way where like the humans have already proven themselves as distrustful and like will destroy their own planet. And so the Uli are like, I, we can't trust you to take care of yourselves. So we have to fix you. But at the same time, no one wants to be controlled like that. We want free will, even if it's to make bad decisions. 
So there's lots of those questions that go through this book series. And so that animation just deals a lot with the tension and the pull and the play and like, you know, what happens when their uh, genes actually mix together. First of all, thank you for these films. I, I was so excited to see Nicole Mitchell, who actually just performed at Carnegie Hall as part of the oh. series. Uh, and it's just an incredible artist. But I was wondering with her uh, association with the AACM and sort of the relationship they have to Afrofuturism, are there any other artists that you draw inspiration from sort of within the Afrofuturistic movement or even in free jazz itself? Um, well, uh, in addition to uh, Nicole Mitchell, um, I studied under um, Tatsu Aoki, who's also a filmmaker and an avant-garde jazz musician. He plays with Nicole all the time. His music and the way that he approaches image making is amazing. He's not an Afrofuturist artist, but he's just a super influential uh, <laughs> filmmaker to me. Um, but I really love the work of Colleen Smith. She does really beautiful videos where she also um, investigates, I think, Afrofuturism in a really interesting way. Um, Robert Pruitt also makes these beautiful drawings and paintings. I love his work. Uh, Carrie Jane Marshalls is also like, I, I, you know, like so much is done in an image. Um, I also really love um, Fantastic Planet is a huge influence to me. It's a French animation film. It's it's amazing if you haven't seen it. Uh, Golden Chain pulls a lot of um, inspiration from Fantastic Planet. Um, what else? Uh, I I also really love um, Lottie Redier. She's like a, a old school animator. She made the first feature animated film um, with. The, and like no one talks about her as much as like the Disney and Fantasia and her work is like amazing. It's such intricate animation she does with um, sort of paper cutouts, um, super beautiful. But yeah, a lot of um, just stuff from all over the place. And of course, like lots of music and films and television. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um... Hi. I just would like to know, being that I'm a person also of the creative heart, when do you know when you know that it's done? <laughs> you can, and I'm here tonight. I just love everyone. That's my daughter sitting right up there in the front. That's to Neil Rock the House. And this is so beautiful. And I am also a creative person and wood is my medium. And when you know that you know it's done, it's done. Do you feel the same way? <laughs> I, I don't, that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if, if like, yeah, I never feel like anything's done. Sometimes it's a deadline. I still look at Golden Chain and think about scenes I want to reanimate or things that, <laughs> that I want to change. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes it's just a matter of like, letting go eventually like once it's like okay this this is it and I just have to let go otherwise I'll be tooling away with it forever so I don't know if there's like a feeling I get there's just a like a point where it's like I have to move on otherwise it's where it's no longer productive like if you know like when it's no longer serving anything then I have to stop working on it <laughs> Hello, uh, I was just wondering uh, about your journey to animation and if there's any other arts that you're also involved in. I know that I'm a photographer and I also just wanted to know when did you first encounter Afrofuturism and how has that, uh, how did that pivot, you know, or change your art um, as you were creating? Yeah, I get, I had a really um, odd way to getting into the arts. I originally wanted to be um, a journalist. I, uh, my high school had like a alternative radio station and, um, and like, I just wanted to be a music journalist where I wrote like fluffy pieces that weren't really like investigating anything very deeply. But while I was working at the radio station, um, 
I'd like come to a point where I felt really, I like, I didn't really like the, um, like the hip hop at the time, it felt really alienating to me as a woman. And then I discovered Tricky and like Massive Attack. And then in discovering that, I discovered um, Deltron, Del the Funko Homo Sapien and his album Deltron 3030 was like mind blowing to me. As someone who like always liked science fiction as a kid, to hear this album where this man was rapping about this insane future in the year in the year 3030 um sorry it's a line from the song um and then i think i didn't really it just sat with me and then so when i went to uh, college and i was a journalism major i kind of quickly discovered that i wasn't a very good writer <laughs> or it just i was having a hard time expressing myself through words and I think the that summer I took a English class that was called that was about cyberpunk and so that was enough that was the first time I heard the phrase Afrofuturism was within the cyberpunk class where we were studying about you know uh, cyberpunk <laughs> and um and the final for the class was instead of writing a paper this is um, this is going to date me, but we had to build like a HTML website, and it wasn't so much of like putting your paper on the website. You had to like really think about like ways to utilize hyperlinks and gifs, and and I had just watched um, being John Malkovich, and I was like, oh, these portals and these different doors you can go into, and I loved the idea of like creating this weird loopy interactive website and I finally was like oh this is makes so much more sense to me like telling stories through visuals rather than just words like it's it's starting to congeal and so I just kind of made this crazy drastic decision where I'd never taken an art class before and I just changed my major and Roll, <laughs> rolled into the art college and I quickly discovered video art, which is what I was interested in. And then like continue to just study more about image and visuals while like holding on to like all the sort of sci-fi, cyberpunk and Afrofuturist stuff that um, I was, that had just always kind of been on the periphery of, of my interests. Anyone else? Wait, I'm going to hand it back over to Dan. That was so incredible. Could could we collectively like clap and cheer and maybe? <laughs> Just so you know, it's like a beautiful full house in here. So we're going to send you a picture of the collective group. I'm going to do that now and then we'll um, Well, thank you guys so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. So I just wanna thank all of you so much for coming out tonight to be with us. Um, Studio has a number of programs coming up. All of those are digital. Um, most recent um, coming up next on March 31st, our artist in residence will have an open studio that features Cameron Granger, Jacob Mason Macklin and Kalisha Wood that'll be on zoom so please go to our website and register for that we do have two exhibitions that are currently on view in Marcus Garvey Park just a couple blocks away um, Thomas J Price has an installation he's a British sculptor this is his first solo installation in the United States also um, at MoMA we have projects Khalil Robert Irving incredible show and it's actually in the free part of MoMA so when you go in before you actually pay if you go to the side, there's a beautiful installation there as well that we encourage you and there's programming in support of that that'll be taking place in April. Um, please visit our website, join our newsletter, stay in touch, stay healthy, and um, we will see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate uh, everyone coming out and enjoying the films. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.